Okay, I'm welcome to Show Studio. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that your opening question? Yeah, it's my opening Oh, how's it? Yes, good, thanks. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a harder opening question. What makes a great fashion image? Oh, that's like a right hook. Uh, anything that stays in your mind for more than five minutes, I guess. Is that what you think about when you're taking a photo? Yeah, I, I actually don't have that. It's so rare that I have had the feeling that I look at a picture and think, oh, that's a good one. But you do know, interestingly enough. Um, but it doesn't happen that often. I find I was working with um, Rag and Bone and my opening meeting with the owner, Marcus, he opened up a magazine and went through each picture and he went, I hate that, I hate that, this is rubbish, I hate that, this is shit, this is rubbish, this is rubbish. And effectively went through sort of like a wad of advertising. And he was like, I don't care what we do, it just has to somehow elevate itself above that. Right? So you're sort of getting into this very banal, systematic way of working where all the images are starting to merge into each other. So I suppose if you ever achieve something above that where it doesn't feel like it fits into that box, then it's always a great feeling of elation. You know? Why does everything look the same at the moment? Do you think it's the pace? Are people less experimental? What is it? Um, yeah, I suppose it's, it's the mentality. Yeah. We've kind of, everyone sort of started to settle into a very corporate way of thinking. I mean, the industry that I started in and that Nick started in is so completely, it's so different to what the industry is now that I almost don't see them as the same thing. I think of them as two completely separate industries that sort of merged at some point from one to the other. Tell me more about that. Well, in the, well I mean, fashion was a cottage industry in the 80s when I started. So, you know, like Body Map, for example, who were my personal favorites they were just always going broke and you know like if you ever got involved in a fashion show with people it was very blue peter the whole thing it was very handmade and everyone was sort of pitching and there was no money and you know it was it, the whole production was in very very lo-fi and none of those come like you know Stephen Leonard or John Flett or Body Map and any of those sort of designers from the 80s most of them just permanently went bust the whole time. I think the only reason Vivian survived was because she had the shop at the end of the King's Road, which turned over a profit. So it, w it was a very, very, very small, kind of almost family run sort of industry. And then in the 90s that changed, you know, it sort of became, it just exploded basically and became much more global. So as each change comes, there's like another layer of, uh, sort of you know, intensified corporate thinking, you know, in, in right the way from the top all the way to the bottom. And so we have to sort of participate in that, that sort of our structure that we have to work within. So. Do you think it will damage the quality of um, the young image makers that will come up within that system? Uh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. But I'm slightly conflicted about that because when you're on set every day, the consistent theme of each shoot is that everybody complains. That's the common denominator is that you're in the, you know, everyone's just moaning and complaining that, you know, it was so great before and blah, 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 which of course is true. But at the same time, I don't really agree with it because if you look at any other industry, so for example, if you look at Apple and you look at the change between the iPod to the iPhone to the new watch, for example, everything's changing so fast and so rapidly that that's the accepted norm within an industry like technology, right? And we demand it as a customer. We want something new, we want something mm. change. And yet within fashion, we seem to have an aversion to change, which is so ironic because we're the one industry that should be changing quicker than everybody else. So it's sort of slightly paradoxical. You know, there's a contradiction within it. So I don't really agree with that kind of... Um, also... I think back in the 90s, when I first started, people used to complain so much then about how bad it was. And now everyone looks back at the 90s and goes, oh my God, it was so amazing. And of course <laughs> it wasn't. It was like the same issues, the same problems. So I was talking to an editor recently. She was like, you were so lucky to work in that period. And I was like, yeah, but everyone complained in that period. They thought the 70s and 80s was better. You know, it, like if you look back at the 70s, there was all these stories about how David Bailey would 
go to Mauritius for 10 days and shoot four pictures and then cut, you know what I mean? And then come back if he could be bothered and blah, blah. That was sort of the story that circulated that all those photographers of that period had very sort of luxurious sort of lifestyle. And then we had to get, you know, four pictures in a day or five pictures. So poor us, you know. And, um, and now you go on set and there's a crew of 70 and there's films going on social media platforms, mm -hmm. movie that I have to shoot, the film, you know, it's completely changed. But if you follow, you know, the way things progress, then it's normal. That's the way it is. So I, my attitude is suck it up. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's go back to your earliest life because you kind of hinted then at your, at the way you came into fashion work. But I want to go back even further and talk about you when you were a boy, what were you like when you were young? Were you creative? No, not really. Uh, I mean, no, I, I like, as a, what, how old? Like really small. Because you got your first camera at nine, so I guess before that. Well, I, yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in a Mike Lee movie. I just, you know, it was very, very, very urban, concrete, not a lot going on, you know. so never were taken to museums or anything like that. There was never any books in our, there was a few photography books actually, because my dad was into amateur photography. Um, but I wasn't surrounded by culture. So in, in that sense. So, um, I mean, I did, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that, I, I guess there was a certain amount of creativity, but I was much more focused. I mean, about, from about nine onwards, I was really focused on cigarettes and pinball machines and then you know 11 it was or 12 it was like alcohol or girls and then and then clothes basically that's sort of very typical not a lot going on actually it was quite dull um, but the one but my dad was very excited about photography and uh, he would there was one one of his friends would buy amateur photography that magazine and then one of them would buy it and then pass it on and then pass it on and pass it on. So by the time it came to our house, it was like really old and fumbled and about six months old. But I do remember reading the pages about telephoto lenses and the effect that you could get, or it explained things in the most sophomoric way. So it'd be like, here's a glass of water. And if you put the light to the left, it'll look like this. And if you put the light to the right, <laughs> it'll look like that. And it basically was just describing light and shadows, right? In the most simplistic way. And I, was, I do remember being quite riveted by that. And then when my sister was about 12 or 13, her boyfriends were punks, basically, who used to come to the house. So we, my dad was always taking pictures of them, and then I started sort of taking some pictures. So I, I guess you can sort of see how it kind of happened. Were you quite naughty or were you quite focused? But yeah, very naughty. What were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> fighting and drinking and, you know, but it's sort of typical suburban stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I got into a lot of trouble actually when I was a kid. And I remember my mom went to see a clairvoyant when I was about 10 and I didn't know what a clairvoyant was. And she was like, you know, like a fortune teller. And, uh, and she said, what she said about your sister wasn't that interesting, but what she said about you was very interesting, which was that you'll follow this sort of line in your life until you get to about 20 and then you're either going to go that way and you'll have a very successful life or you're going to go that way and you're going to get into a sort of darker ways right and that is almost exactly what happened i just got into so much trouble up until i was 20 and then i found photography and just went like that completely the other direction do you feel quite lucky then yeah very, like incredibly lucky yeah most of my friends that i went to school with didn't have that uh those opportunities Mm. And well, tell, tell me, I'm interested in that point where you got into clothes, because that seems like quite, you said there wasn't much access to culture, but what was it that made you get interested in getting dressed? Well, I mean, being the most exciting, the school in, in, on the south coast of England in the 80s was probably the worst period in British education, because the, um, during the whole sort of Thatcher period where that, you know, our culture sort of became slightly dismantled in some degree. And so the, the unions started to lose a grip on what they could control, especially with the teachers and stuff like the shipyards and everything. So effectively, they took away pension schemes and strip wages and all the rest. So anyone who had any sense got out and went into private education and the people that were left were just completely depressed about what they were left with, essentially, you know. 
So we had some very, very uninteresting teachers that seemed really banal and just couldn't really be bothered to teach. So, and the kids were quite wild at that period. So it, nothing, I don't remember really learning anything at school that was of any interest, except history maybe. I had a very good history teacher. Um, so the one thing that was really exciting and riveting was seeing the change in fashion in that period, because even though I'd missed punk, which I'm still resentful about, <laughs> I did sort of catch then what came next, which was new romantics and skinheads and rockabilly and scar and all those different things. And it changed every year, you know, so, or less. So, you know, we, we were constantly seeing that come through. And then of course, ID and NME and all those magazines started to appear within my group of friends. Um, and so you started to be much more aware of what was happening. You know, there was suddenly a, a way of, you know, the, many, many, many years pre-internet, you know, you had to really search for information. So when, when ID came out and the Face magazine, it was like the first time we'd ever had it delivered, you know, rather than, because before that it was just Chinese whispers through friends at mm. school. You know, it's quite, it's quite an exciting time. So I really enjoyed the social aspect of school. I had a lot of friends and the clothes change and the style and everything else was great. Mm. And what were your ambitions? I've read it before that sort of your only prospect was working in a chemist factory. No, I actually, I worked in a, in a air freshener factory. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> which made me, I have to say, that two weeks in that air freshener factory changed my life forever because it was so awful. Did you get fired? No, I left because of Bobby Gillespie actually, which is ironic because Katie's coming here later. But what happened was, um, I was about to go into work the next day and a friend of mine said, there's this amazing band called the Jesus and Mary Chain. And apparently they're like the next Sex Pistols and they're playing tonight in Brighton. So we have to go. So I looked at the, I was trying to figure out how I was going to get home from work and get changed and put on my best outfit and then get on a train and drive into Brighton and get there in time for this concert. And I figured out that I couldn't make it. So I decided to quit my job. But the factory I was working in was out in the countryside. It was like 20 miles from anywhere. And everyone went to work on a coach. So I just walked out. And then I was stuck in a country lane with 20 miles to walk. And luckily a cement mixer came by. So I hitched a lift with a cement mixer and managed to get home. And then I went to this concert which was the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen because the, the hype had been built up so much. And then when, the, when they walked out on stage, everyone threw glasses at the stage. So it was this explosion <laughs> of violence, you know, it was the most incredible thing. And then within half a song, they all just walked off the stage and left. And then my friend got hit in the glass with a, and he had a big, he still got a big scar on his cheek. So we took him to hospital and, and then I got home and then my mum had realised I quit my job. So there was a big fight and then there's this whole drama and did a little, so I feel like the Jesus and Mary chain saved me. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me that, that point where you thought about taking pictures, because you, you got your first camera, as you said, when you were kind of young and you started taking pictures. So yeah, my dad worked for the newspapers and he gave me one, he gave me a camera with one roll of film. He was a bit tight fisted actually, I have to say. So it wasn't like we had buckets full of things, but he gave me one roll of film and said, here, try this and I'll take it into work and get it developed for free. So I took some pictures and I can't, I can't say that it was a sort of epiphany in any way, but I was definitely quite intrigued by it. And then I never did it ever again. I still have the pictures. And this one was about nine. And then when I left home, uh, I started skateboarding with all these kids in Brighton. And it was the first thing I'd ever seen that really felt like it needed recording. Although it was not a conscious decision. I didn't was like, okay, I must go and buy a camera. And I just sort of drifted into it. But you know, skateboarding in the 1970s was so kind of clean and American. Mm. But then when it reinvented itself in the 80s, it was much more, associated with punk music and thrash right. music. It was kind of like the post-punk Californian music scene came with it, which was like the Dead Kennedys and DOA and all that sort of stuff. So it had a really good music scene attached to it and the kids were much more sort of thrashy and punky. So it just felt like something that needed recording. So I got a camera and started taking pictures of it. And then I met these fashion students in Brighton and they kind of liked my pictures and they were like, oh, you know, you can go to take them to a magazine. And they then drew me into taking pictures of them. And that's how the whole thing started. Mm. So it was quite 
weirdly organic and easy at that point. Explain the assisting trajectory though, because you did assist. For yeah, at 15 I got a job as a hairdresser in London and I was really bad at it. Were you cutting boys' hair or girls' hair? I would, not even. I was shampooing and sweeping the floors and I met Eugene and um, Eugene was like this superstar kid from the East End of London that Trevor Sorby had discovered and they thought he was going to be this great hairdresser. How right they were about that. And, um, and so I kind of met Eugene and, and Jane Howe was a hairdresser, although I didn't meet her then. She was, a, she was an assistant at uh, Sassoon's. There was all these different people that were hairdressers. And um, one day, the, and I did it for about a year, and then the hairdresser that I was working for had um, sort of aspirations to become a photographer. So he set up a studio, not that different to this, in the basement of the salon and convinced the owner that they would do all these hair pictures and then put them in hair magazines. So I kind of saw the process for the first time, the model, the lights and everything, and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna do that. And it was quite simple. Mm. And then I tried to get a job, which took a while, just asking around. I called Nick, actually. Uh, Nick and Charlotte have both told me that's not true, that I didn't call them. And the reason they know it's not true is because they always would respond to everybody that called them, even if they didn't end up working with them. So I think it's one of those things in my mind you that I decided it. that I was going to do and then never did it. Dave but Sims said the same thing. He said he applied to assist with Nick and he got rejected. So uh, yeah. Maybe they're See, lying I, to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't tell if it's either me lying to myself or they're lying to me. I have to have a conversation with them about this. But it, I was convinced that I'd spoken to Simon Foxton and then I was going to ring them. Mm. And then, anyway, some, whatever. But then I did eventually get a job with Norman Watson, who at the time was doing a lot of Buffalo stuff with Ray Petrie. Mm. And um, so I got to work with Ray, which was amazing. And, um, and I worked with Norman for about, I think I did about six months or seven months with him, and then I got fired. Tell me about getting fired. Well, I have to say, Dick was, if I did come for an interview and he didn't give me a job, he was very smart because I was a terrible assistant. Um, I kept on looking through the lens on the set and he told me not to do it, but I couldn't help myself. I wanted to see what he was seeing. I couldn't figure out the correlation between his eye and the camera and the Polaroid. There seemed to be this sort of disconnect. So I kept, whenever he wasn't looking, I would sneak over and have a look through the lens. <laughs> so the, that's good though. The problem was you were too curious rather than sort of Too lazy. curious, yeah. No, 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 yeah, but then I didn't want to do any hard work because I wanted to watch. <laughs> I thought it was my given right that as I'd managed to get myself on set that I was then allowed to watch everything and what they wanted from me was just to run around and make tea and clean up. Yeah. Um, so I got fired and then, but we stayed friends and then um, I think that was it and then I just started. I Do just, you think you're quite precocious as a person? Probably, yeah. Has that helped you? Um, I think both me and my sister have a similar um, ability to sort of barge forward obliviously. Although I'm much more sensitive now I'm older. But when I, if, I knew, I, if I knew myself then I'd be so embarrassed probably because I was so aggressive to sort of just try anything. Like my first ever job as a photographer, I went to see, uh, I went to the Face magazine with you know, a box of pictures. And I sat in reception and I, d I didn't have an appointment. I just banged on the door, you know. And then, um, and I waited and I waited. And there was a very nice girl on reception called Kelly Wurtz. It was very sweet. And she was like, well, just, just wait and I'll see if I can get you in to see someone. And of course that wasn't going to happen. So then I just kept coming back. And eventually they were like, oh God, he's just not going away, this guy, right? So we're going to have to cut him some slack. So eventually she was like, fine, Phil's going to see you. So Phil Bicker was the art director. So I eventually got to see Phil and he went through my pictures and he went, yeah, all right, I'll give you a job. So I thought he was just saying that to get rid of me. So, and at the time I didn't have a telephone, so I gave him the number of the Escape Club in Brighton, which is where I used to go every night. And I didn't think I'd ever hear from him again. And then about three weeks later, I went to the Escape Club and they said, oh, the Face magazine called it, you've got to ring them. So I rang them and they said, okay, you're shooting tomorrow and you're shooting a band called the Stone Roses, who no one had ever heard of. Um, and I believe they'd asked Nick to do it and Nick said no. So um, he told me that. 
So I called a friend of mine and I was like, do you know this band, The Stone Roses? And he said, oh yeah, it's a rock band from Los Angeles and the guy wears a bandana, they're very famous. So I was thinking Guns N' Roses were coming. <laughs> and, I, and Guns N' Roses, even they're quite interesting to look back on, but at the time in London in the 80s, they were just the cheesiest looking band ever. So I'm like, <laughs> shit, I can't believe my luck that the first ever portrait I'm gonna take for the Face magazine is this cheesy rock band. So in my mind, I thought, okay, I'll be like Richard Avedon and I'll do a monumental eight by 10 plate of them and it'll somehow cover up the fact that they look bad. <laughs> when in fact it does the opposite, you know. Um, but I'd never actually seen an eight by 10 plate camera. So I called through and said, just deliver me an eight by 10 and everything. And I arrived at the studio one hour before the band arrived and was presented with this black box full of pieces, you know, like a Lego kit or something. So I almost started crying, you know, like really upset, like, fuck, what am I going to do? So I ran next door and begged this assistant to come and help me to construct it. So he came and he like screwed it all together and pieced <laughs> it and showed me the lens, you know, like, this is how you do it. And then you and then he helped me load all the plates. So I had 15 plates loaded and then the door swung open and rather than Guns N' Roses, the Stone Roses come in who had just started and they were so arrogant and so beautiful and like had that amazing energy that they knew they were about to become the biggest band on the planet, which they did. So they stood and we did 10 amazing plates and they just were so confident and then they were like, right, that's it, we're fucking out of here, mate. And they just walked out the door <laughs> and they were gone, you know, and I was like, I had no idea if the film had come out or anything and then it did and the face liked it and then I started working for them and that was that. So tell me, because Brighton seems to be your base at this point, tell me about moving to London because I read, you've said in interviews before that that year where you kind of came to London, it was probably had the most profound impact on you than other years. Or were you just being gushing when you said that? When, when did I say that? You said it when you were talking to Tyrone. About when I first moved to London? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, moving, to, moving from the suburbs to any major city, specifically London in the 80s, because London was quite an amazing place, the impact is so extreme that you can't quite absorb everything that's happening. You know, it's like a, suddenly life's on steroids. So that definitely had a, there's no doubt that that had a huge impact. And th there was no way I was ever going back. The problem is I couldn't afford to live there. So I carried on living in Brighton for a while and was taking the train up, but I didn't have enough money for the train fare. So I sort of deduced this system where I could avoid the ticket guy, where you had to hide in the toilet between Brighton and Haywards Heath and then he'd do the first part of the train. And then you could come out between Haywards Heath and East Croydon and then from East Croydon, every, the train was so packed full of commuters that the guy couldn't make it up and down the train, so you were safe, so you could relax. How and often then, did you get caught? Uh, I don't think I ever got caught, actually. I always wiggled my way out of it. And then when you got to London, you went and bought, you, got, you said, oh, I couldn't get, buy a ticket. Can I buy a ticket from the last stop, which I guess was uh, like East Croydon, and it was like 25p or something. So I got away with that for two years, I think. And then, um, and then eventually I moved up. I got a flat somewhere and started, slept on a few people's floors. When did you start realizing that you kind of had a career, that you were successful, you were doing well? Um, quite soon, because there were, the music industry created a steady stream of income. Mm. You could do album sleeves all day long. You know, there was so much money in the music industry at that point. So quite soon after working for the face, I mean, I remember them paying me 110 pounds a page and it just felt like a fortune, you know, I just couldn't believe it. That I was actually gonna get paid to do something that exciting. And then, <clears throat> and then um, I went to see Camilla Lowther to see if she would be my agent, but she was, she was over, what's the word? She had too many artists at the time. So she said she couldn't do it. Um, and I believe David went to see Camilla at the same time within a week or so and Julie Brown who owns MAP agency was working for Camilla at the time so so Julie contacted both me and Dave and said if I'll start an agency with you guys so she mm. set up MAP um, and she very quickly made a lot of contacts with them with the record companies so we started working for Virgin and EMI and all those different companies and you can make a pretty good living out of that so 
Mm. It felt tangible, like it was something that could happen. But I didn't shoot any fashion campaigns for a long time. That came a lot later. Did you care about fashion at this point or were you still just kind of into clothes? Well, everything's so separate now, but in, in those days it was all together. Mm. You know, you, you went out in the evening or to nightclubs with filmmakers and musicians and fashion design, like it was all one kind of unit. It's very, very integrated. Now everything's completely separate. So I did, it just sort of crept in, you know, it was, I know, I don't ever remember sitting there going, okay, that's it, I'm going to become a fashion photographer. I just started to move in that direction. And then um, Carl Templer was a window dresser, I believe. I think that's how he started with, with Derek Procoat. They had a company called UTO that was really good. And they were very, you know, interesting and sort of around the same circuit. And I remember going into the face one night and uh, Nick, Nick Logan, who owned the face, his son was there and he said, oh, you should look at those guys work. I think you'd be a good team to work together. So we joined together and did the first fashion story for the face. And then I did another one with Adam Howe soon afterwards for Arena magazine when Neville Brody was still there. It was probably his last issue. And then <clears throat> it just kind of, it really did happen. But contrary to the other photographers, I felt that the other photographers that started at the same time as me were naturally really good fashion photographers and I never had that sense about myself. I think it took me about 15 years before I figured it out. Why do you say that? Uh, I don't know, just how I felt. It just, I didn't feel like a natural fashion photographer. I felt like... I felt that I was a good photographer. I didn't feel like I was naturally a fashion photographer. What's different about taking a fashion picture to just like a, a band or any other picture? The way that you are able to look at the dress slash outfit and try and construct in your mind the best way to photograph it. What's the hair? What's the makeup? What's the environment? What, what is going to bring out of this what the designer was really thinking about? I found that the hardest part to really come together in the toolkit, if you know what I mean. It took me a long time. Kept making really clumsy mistakes. What kind of mistakes? I don't know, it just felt a bit clunky. Mm. It's a bit like a sports car running on diesel engine or something. Nothing, something about it wasn't quite right, you know what I mean? Whereas I saw my contemporaries doing it very well. Mm. And then some, at, at some point I would imagine it just sort of clicked in. Do you think you have quite a fixed idea of what beauty is? No, not, not really. It changes all the time. What is it usually? Well, sometimes I'm very old fashioned and it's just a blonde girl with big boobs. It's like really interesting. And then sometimes it's something completely abstract and random and just miles away from anything. You know, just like, yeah, I, I can't put my finger on it. It's so all chopping and changing the whole time. People often describe your work as cinematic. That's a word that come, came up a lot when I was researching you. Do you think that your work is cinematic? I, <laughs> I guess. I don't ever think about it in those terms. I mean, I like movies. So I guess it goes in there. I mean, I remember being obsessed with television when I was a kid, you know. And if a film came on that I liked, I'd be excited about a week before. So I, I, it, honestly, I was probably more excited about cinema than I was about fashion. Mm. But then the two came together because then I was so excited. I, I can still remember what looking at all the girls on the playground, especially when the skinhead period came in where they had the sort of shaved head with the fringe in the back. I just thought that was the most amazing look for all these girls in the town you know that was a particularly good one um and i do remember even as a young kid walking down the street and my mum said when these boys walk past you look the other way so of course i immediately looked you know and it was this kid with green teeth and spiky hair and everything which i just thought was so brilliant you know so i'm kind of i'm a bit of a contradiction in the one sense that i'm very conventional suburban boy and yet part of me wants to see anything that I've never seen before 
and sort of anything that's testing or pushing or provoking or I'm very excited by that. Do you think you're rebellious or do you think you just like rebellion? Yeah, I mean, I am naturally rebellious. There's no doubt about it. How so? Just, you know, um, it still comes out in me in the most juvenile ways. Like I went, there's a, there's a gymnasium in, um, in LA where Arnold Schwarzenegger used to train called Gold's Gym. And every day I walk past it, these huge pumped up guys come out. And I just thought it was, I was like, okay, that's the gym I'm going to go to. It'd be so <laughs> hilarious, like me weightlifting in between these monsters, right? So I went in and I said to the guy, oh, you know, can I talk to one of the representatives here? I'd like to open a thing. So the guy said to me, here's a form. Can you fill it out? And, and the guy will be over in a minute. So I looked at it. And I decided that I didn't want to fill it out. So I wrote fuck you on it and handed it back to the guy. And I was like, I can't believe at 48, I'm still being so ridiculous. You know, the fact that he'd insisted that I fill out a form that I didn't want to fill out. So the sort of 10 year old comes out of me quite a lot. <laughs> and tell me a little bit, I want to go back to that idea of your work being cinematic. Because one of the things that I find interesting in your work, and you might think I'm completely wrong in my reading of this, is that I think there's like an interesting tension between it being quite cinematic and quite kind of fictional and um, very much about a narrative and then this other side where it's very kind of real and very documentary based in some ways. And maybe it's just to do with how time has changed, but... Yeah, I, I, I was... I mean, I definitely liked war photography as a kid. Yeah. I think I, I, I had a Time Life book um, that... It, it, you can probably still get it. It was like a silver book that was like a very traditional one that they produced in the 70s or the 80s. And one of them was about photojournalism. And so it ran the gamut of sporting photography, war photography, you know, all that sort of, a lot of Pulitzer Prize winning journalistic photography. And I, I was really obsessed with that. Mm. So I think a lot of those images um, stayed with me. And mm. I think I photographed them a lot. I'm always seeing, so. I find it very difficult to be in a studio every day or whatever it is and trying to create something because mm. you know our bound our, essentially we have a girl in a dress that's it right and sometimes an object with the girl in a dress but our parameter is a girl in a dress or a guy or whatever that's what we're shooting so to to reinvent the wheel every single day, you know, to try and find something that you haven't done before, not not for the audience, but just for yourself, you know, some some sense of stimulation or excitement. Mm. I find it a lot more difficult to do that in a studio, whereas when you're out on the street, you can be photographing someone and you've just done this amazing hairstyle and it's all starting to look really great and the light's perfect and then someone will just walk through the frame and I love that, you know, like it's totally unexpected. There's like a random nature to it. So I'm definitely drawn to that mm. and I try and use it as much as I possibly can. Mm. But I guess what I'm asking in a way is how much of it is about those authentic kind of haphazard moments that happen with documentary and how much is about this kind of pre-decided idea of a narrative? I very rarely go in with a pre-decided idea, to be honest. And if I do, I do in advertising more yeah. because it's very structured. You know, the client has to have it, you know, because they've spent three months selling it. So they'll come on set with, you know, ideas and, you know, you try and aim for that and then you start moving away from it. But in editorial, I try and keep it as loose as possible so you can constantly change and move and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I kind of, I feel like I use people as props random strangers you know they sort of become the props that's interesting does the what do, what's the model then to you are they the subject or are they because i find it interesting how you treat the model sometimes is they they seem to be part of a bigger story it's not particularly about them yeah i've never really thought i've never thought that um but it's probably true yeah, I just, I'm just, I'm doing anything f to break the mold of one girl in a dress with great hair and makeup standing there in front of the camera, like anything. I think the, um, I said that I was doing an interview recently with Christopher Michael and the one thing that came up constantly when I was a kid was that my dad and his amateur photography friends would go to air shows and photograph an aeroplane in the sky and it would be a dot, right? 
and they would all do the same thing, you know, unless one had an extra telephoto lens and it was a slightly bigger dot. But ultimately, it was a sky with a dot. <laughs> and I just never understood why they would waste. To me, it didn't make any sense, you know. If the plane crashed or something, then yeah, great. But So when skateboarding came around, I remember standing on the top of the ramp because it was the first time that vert skating came in and these kids were really good, they were really great. South, like a lot of black kids from South London that come from poor backgrounds but they're very aggressive skaters and really talented. You know, all dressed in sort of more raggedy clothes and torn stuff and you know, the one consistent theme was their van sneakers, that was about it, or Converse or whatever. And when these, and they were always, they always had a ghetto blaster playing this music, you know, this sort of Californian post-punk music. So when they popped out of the top of the ramp in these clothes and doing these incredible tricks to thrash music, it felt about as far away from a dot in the sky that you could possibly get. You know what I mean? It was the first time I'd ever seen something that really felt like it filled the frame properly and it was exciting. So when I went to get the film back from the lab, I was like, okay, this is amazing. You know, it's like, finally I've got something. So. I've been pursuing that ever since. That's basically what I just try and fill the frame with something to entertain myself. And hopefully in the meantime, the client will be happy as well. I find it interesting the way you refer to fashion because you say, you know, a girl in a dress. There's not much, it doesn't seem like you're naturally that enthused or excited by the fashion. Well, because, the, no, that's not, I mean, you have to understand we came in and there was Lee Bowery. Right, so like that's your benchmark essentially. You've got probably the most extraordinary period in, you know, fashion, costume, design, or whatever. Um, and so the rapid decline since then in, in, into the banal has sort of been so, it's very hard. So now I have to think outside of, you know, if you put, I guess Lee McQueen played with a lot, a lot of stuff and gave a lot of photographers some things to work with, which was very exciting. But fa you can't sell fashion like that. No one wants to buy it. There's no audience for it. So we'll keep being given, you know, the, our, our thing is how long is the skirt? Is it, you know, this length or this length or this length? Or, you know, the, it's kind of tough to get really excited about that. Although I often do. I mean, the editors are sometimes still mind blowing the way they can make something look interesting. You know, it still surprises me and it's still really exciting. So you try and, uh, bring that up as much as you can by using the most amazing model and the best hair and the best makeup and add and add and add and add but eventually I would still want to add more so then I bring this sort of chaos to the occasion. Mm. I want to talk to you about those Prada campaigns which you're probably tired of talking about but I think there's something that you're so known for and they're kind of I think with things like Tumblr and Instagram coming along I think they've kind of been re-seen by a set of people that hadn't seen them the first time and have seen them in a different way. Right. And how do you find, tell me firstly about doing them, but also about that kind of continued legacy that they've had. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised by it because the, the you know, I think what I really liked about fashion was that you tossed it in the bin after a, a month, you know, and moved on to the next issue. So I don't think anyone ever did anything in that period and thought that it would have any sense of longevity whatsoever. So I guess it is surprising that, you know, 20 years later or whatever it is, people have any interest in it whatsoever. Um, but it's probably the most effort that I've ever put into a series of pictures. And it was really a timing issue in the sense that, um, again, I saw a lot of my contemporaries working for you know, I was living with Mario Sorrenti and he started, you know, he, he started working for Calvin Klein before he could even blink, you know, it was like he decided he was a photographer one day and he was shooting <laughs> for Calvin the next, I mean, literally, you know. So, um, which was very exciting to watch. Um, but I didn't really do that. So I was still sort of tossing around and not really shooting any fashion campaigns and wanting to and then Craig left Nick and he started taking pictures and then he started working for Jill Sander and Dave was doing his thing and all these different people were doing their stuff and I'm still waiting and waiting and waiting thinking one day I'll do a nice campaign. So when Mutra asked me to do those pictures I was like okay I'm definitely going to kick up the gears a little bit. And it was right at a point where I was very, the, the, the whole campaign came about because it was pre um, Photoshop. So you couldn't just desaturate a picture in 30 seconds like you can now. 
So for two years, I invested, like spent a long, 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 long time trying to figure out how to desaturate film because film had become more and more saturated as each couple of years they developed the technology. It got worse and worse. And I didn't like it. So I kept on harping back to sort of 70s or 80s film stills that you saw in magazines and they had a sort of very beautiful quality. Mm. And I also liked the quality of pictures in um, National Geographic. And I think the photographers were using transparency and then printing on a very specific paper. It just had, it, it was slightly muted, but very rich. So that's what I was trying to achieve. And I couldn't get it. So I kept trying and trying and trying and trying and it didn't work and it didn't work. So then I was talking to Brian at BDI and he said, well, maybe look at a reciprocity, which is where you sort of over, you, you leave the lens open for a long time and, and it has this sort of effect, you know. So what we decided was that the best way to do it was to bring the exposure level down as far as you possibly can in a very dark situation and leave the lens open for a little bit longer and then you possibly might get this sort of look which is what we did so all those Prada pictures were like long one second exposure so Amber was like you know, for ages all day long she went and like we're always running in and rubbing her legs because she had cramp you know <laughs> um, and I and but then the minute you add a big light to that environment it just blows everything out of proportion. So the light's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So then we discovered that within the film industry, you could have this very tiny little light for doing car in um, commercials. They could tuck it up behind the, you know, the visor and light the face. And it had a dimmer switch on it. So we bought tons of those and started lighting the picture with these tiny little lights and just brought the levels down further and further and further. So there was a crossover period between Mutual having the patience and finance to do that because we were only doing two pictures a day and the film quality at that particular time really lent itself to that and then it was you know a couple of years later it was all gone film stocks were gone and fashion was speeding up a little bit so it was really a window of opportunity that I took and it you know it worked really well and then quite soon afterwards MoMA asked me to put the pictures in the mm. permanent archive so you could tell at that point they'd had some kind of impact I suppose. Mm. Do you understand the kind of renewed impact now? It must be strange to see young image makers kind of referencing or copying those pictures. I guess. I mean, it, in, I wanted to see pictures by Helmut Newton and Guy Bourdin when I was a kid because I'd seen one Guy Bourdin picture and one Helmut Newton picture in a book somewhere and I wanted to see more. I think Helmut was alive and was being much more proactive in creating books. Guy Bourdin was dead and there were none, right? Um, and I felt like I needed to see it. So I did some research and I found out that if you went to the Musée d'Arte in Paris, they had an archive of magazines and a photocopy machine. So, you know, I trotted off to Paris for a week and spent the whole week in the photocopying machine and brought them back. And I took them to the Face magazine and Lee Swillingham was the art director at the time and he'd never even heard of him, you know. So I showed him all these pictures and he was kind of speechless, you know. So in those days, you had to do your homework and really go and find stuff and then it had an impact. The amazing thing about today is that you can just find anything, you know. Mm. But on the one hand, it does make you a little lazy, but it's all available. And it doesn't surprise me that people are constantly looking back and digging things out and wanting to re-look at them again because everything in distance, you know, looks more interesting. Mm. When, when I was chatting to, to Dave Sims for this series, he said, you know, whoever did it last did it first in some ways and because of the pace of the industry, you can kind of, someone can do something that maybe they didn't invent and then they become known for it. Do you feel that sometimes where people are doing you and then getting... Absolutely. My, my Giovanni, my agent, said to me, you've got to own it. Doesn't matter if it's not yours, just own it. You know, so shoot it once and it's not yours. You shoot it 10 times, you suddenly own it. It's yours, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it, it's really true that, yeah. Does it scare you though, ever? No, it's part of the process. You know, it's all the sort of in the washing machine. Mm. Are you competitive? It's interesting when you were talking about sort of the, those, you know, watching your peers kind of get these big campaigns or or sort of succeed in taking fashion imagery? Are you competitive with your peers? Do you look at what they're doing? Uh, I'm not competitive with them. I'm actually quite apathetic, but I'm quite intimidated by them. I see people doing really good work and I think, fuck, that's really good. 
I should be doing something that good. Um, but I never actively went out to try and find work in the same vein, if you like. If anything, I should have been. I, I didn't really feel like I deserved it, so I was always shocked that they would give me a job in the first place. Why don't you feel like you deserve it? I didn't think it was very good, so I'd kind of look at the pictures and be like, Ooh, let's <laughs> hope they don't realise they're shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then sometimes they'd be like these are great and then I'd be like she's lying you know so um and then I remember I finally Mario said to me you're gonna have to go like you've got to start working for a bigger magazine you can't just be at the face for the rest of your life so the next time I went to New York he said go and see Fabian at Bazaar so I went to see Fabian and I showed him a story I did for the face and in those days which is very different to now he was like fine give you a story for the next issue here's the editor that's what I want you to do. You're shooting next Wednesday. We'll shoot K Mars. It was all done, right? It's like it's kind of how it was. And um, so I went out and I did a, a really good story with Kate on the street. And it was the first story that I thought that was really, really, really good. And then I got fired by the magazine <laughs> as soon as I handed the pictures in. <laughs> so I didn't really understand what you know the how to make it work. Do you um, ever still have that where you look at your work and you, you don't know if it's good or No, bad? now I know. Yeah, there's a point. If you do anything for long enough, you figure it out. That's interesting. And what, what do you think your... When, we, when I asked you right at the start, what makes a great fashion image? Do you think... Is that... Do you have that when you look at your work? What makes you think your work is good? It's kind of a fluke though, you know what I mean? Like you can try your hardest to come up with a good idea, but there's still that random element of, will the model be any good today? Will the hair be any good? Like you, there's always something that can get in the way, you know what I mean? Mm. But I, I feel like my value at this point is, you know, that I can walk on, like I walked onto set recently and I could just, tell within 10 seconds of looking at girl clothes hair there was absolutely zero chance it was going to work zero and the clients were going to hate it and so i immediately you know and then you're stuck in a political situation because four of the five people on set that count really think it's going to work and you can't waste all day because there's no time and you can't just walk in and go this is shit it's not going to work so you have to be incredibly diplomatic so you're kind of like a therapist and a psychoanalyst and a photographer and a filmmaker and an editor and all this different stuff you know you're juggling a lot of stuff so i had to very carefully maneuver my way around the situation to sort of maybe spread the idea that it might not work and we should not wait too long just in case it doesn't you know, and by 12, we'd figured out that it didn't work and we now had to change it and then we changed it and by one o'clock it was working and, and the client went home happy at the end of the day. So I feel like my value to be able to do that now is, you know, is very warranted, you know what I'm saying? I deserve to be there. Sort of thing. Are you quite controlling? Uh, no, not really. I'm very open. I'll, I love people to come on set and just throw a curveball in there. I'm controlling when I feel like they're making a mistake, when it's obvious. Mm. Yeah, but you can't, it's quite hard to be controlling when there's 70 people on set, which on a lot of advertising jobs there is, and there's just so many plates spinning at the same time. You know, you, you definitely have to let it go a little bit. Mm. I tend, what I tend to do is let everyone do their thing and I just watch. And then the minute I feel like it's going off in the wrong direction, I'll then step in and like try and you know, guide it, push mm. it. And, you know, I work with a lot of the same people and they know that I do that. So if I come over and say something, then they'll engage in a conversation and be like, okay, well, let's look at that. I think there's a lot of trust involved. It's a hugely trusting environment, basically. Mm. Yeah. I'm interested in what drives you because if, you know, it seems like you did come to that realisation where you kind of had confidence in your work and you said you're not particularly competitive with your peers. So what is it that makes you keep shooting is it just a job or is it is there some kind of need to do it i mean i do love it i mean i was thinking that what would be really healthy is if we set up a union and that all fashion photographers have to have a license before they can perform and in order to get that license every year you have to go and work in a factory for one week of the year because <laughs> it would be a really great equalizer and it would really make people appreciate what they have because all you essentially you spend 80 percent of your day listening to complaints right that's, that's kind of part of our job everyone's moaning 
So, and I, and I do it as well, so I'm as bad as everyone else, but when you really think about what an extraordinary job it is, it's incredible really, you know, that you have this opportunity to go into a studio and create something, you know. It's really, it's an amazing, very, very few people are that lucky. And, you know, the role of the fashion photographer, like the film director, is one of the last dictatorial positions left. So, you know, you really can have the ability to walk in and just do what you want. Yeah. Is, is that changing though? Because, you know, with things like social media and stuff, everyone's an image maker now and images are so much more temporary and they're kind of treated in a much more throwaway way. I guess, but it, uh, ultimately they all come back to you at the end to make sure. You know what I mean? No matter how many pieces of mechanics are going on. Hey, can I have a cup of tea, by the way? Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it all kind of comes to you at the end of the day. It does, mm -hmm. no matter how much it changes. There has to be one person on set that can steer everything. Mm. You know, and you, you find great collaborators to help you with that, that make your life so much easier and bring so much to the table. And I'm eternally grateful for that. I'm still really excited about the people that I work with. But ultimately it does fall in your lap to steer the ship. And I don't think people realize that until you're not there. Like there's been, a, I had a situation where I had to go and see, a, I got ill on set basically. And I th it's only ever happened to me once. And I, I knew I could get to the end of the day if I could quickly shoot to the doctor. So I was like, give me an hour and I'll be back and I'll be fine. So they whizzed me over. And, and I, as I was leaving, I said to everyone, just keep going in my absence. You might find something great. You know what I mean? And then when I got back, there was like uh, the color had drained out of everyone's face. And they were like, thank fuck, you're back. <laughs> you know, sort of panic set in, you know. And I see a lot of the people that I work with, they go off and do stuff. And they bring so much to the table for me when I'm there as a collaborator, but when they're allowed to do it on their own, they don't seem to bring that to the table. And I don't understand why that is, it's strange. It's almost like you allow them to, you know, you create an environment where people can sort of bring their best to the table. Mm. Talk to me about some of the people you've collaborated with, because I'm interested in the ones within fashion, but also outside of fashion, people like Jenny Savile. I, I think that's really intriguing. Do you think there's, are there parallels between the kind of people you enjoy collaborating with, or is it more haphazard than that? Um, I think, I mean, the two most interesting women that I've collaborated with was Mutua and Jenny, I suppose. And the similarity between the two of them is that they're both insanely inquisitive and highly intelligent. So they both make for very exciting collaborate. You know what I mean? The conversations are amazing. So, and Mutual, the same with Jenny, would just go anywhere. There was nothing that you couldn't talk to her about, you know? So, um, that was really great. I mean, I, I suppose I tend to be interested in anyone that can bring something to the table that I haven't heard before. And that's what I got out of Jenny, was that she, ex she just told me things that I'd know, I didn't know existed, you know? She came from another place, so. And she grew up in a different environment and her world was so, like her art, the way she created it was so different. You know, because at the end of the day, I am a commercial fashion photographer. I think of myself like that. I'm there to please the client. I'm, you know, if I can cheer myself up in the process, that's great. But that is ultimately what I'm there to do. So with Jenny, who has no one, nothing, you know, there's not, uh, no one has an opinion on her work in any way whatsoever, except for maybe Larry when she hands it in or make a comment one way or the other. But she doesn't answer to anybody, mm. which is a completely unique, in this day and age, you know, it's a totally unique environment. So, and she always said to me, I could, I could never do what you do. I don't understand your ability to be able to do it. It's really impressive actually that you can walk on set and have to, rather than just take the picture you want to take, you have to answer to this and listen to that and try, you know, steer mm. this kind of political environment, you know. What are you like when you shoot? Because you're very kind of, at ease and personable. When you shoot, are you slightly more aggressive? No, just like this. Same. Lots of tea, lots of jokes. Um, yeah, no, the same. I try and, I don't, I tend to not work with people that change that. If someone brings something to the table that throws that out the window, I'll generally move away, you know. So, but I kind of get on with most people. 
Are you it's, it's easy to get on with. Yeah, I am. But it's easy to get on with anyone for 10 hours. I find, and that the once in a while you'll meet someone that's just so vile that you just like, that. okay, that's it, I'm done. I never want to work with that person ever again, but it's rare. Like know. who? Well, you want me to say it live on camera? Why not? <laughs> yeah. Bring me a rope and I'll tie it around my neck right now. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I want to talk, it's inter I found it very interesting just then what you said about Jenny because I think there's, you know, you say I am a commercial fashion photographer, there's definitely that thirst in you I think to pursue personal projects or to do things that you've, like even just doing a film, like that must have taken some kind of personal drive to not just be doing a job dictated by other people. No, I am very passionate about things. Yeah, I just opened a hotel and I'm really excited about that because it's some, I don't know anything about it, so mm. it's kind of... Um, it's so abstract to me and it's such a learning process that I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really excited about things that I don't know. I mean, I remember saying to my parents, oh, here comes the tea. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I remember saying to my folks when I was a kid, I guess I was like 18, that I want to be a fashion photographer and they looked at me like I'd said astronaut. They were like, what is that? And I was like, well, you know, someone who takes photographs of girls in dresses. Oh, okay. And then I remember them sort of looking at each other like, the fuck is he talking about? Like rolling their eyes, you know. So there, that wasn't a career that you could take. But the fact that it seems so difficult to achieve and so hard to get into made me want to do it even more. And I still have that. Was that part of things like doing the hotel and doing the film? It was to just prove that you could? <laughs> Yeah, it's like if it, I mean, all of us have certain passions. You can't, you can't push yourself into something that you're not excited about, right? You hold the teacup in the most amazing way. Wow. <laughs> it just looks, it's the hat and the teacup, it's the combination, sorry. Yeah. Just it, oh, I like the fact you've handed me a China teacup, it's so nice. Never get these in America, I'll tell you. I had to ship mine over. Um, <laughs> I can do anything as long as I'm really passionate, if it's something. But then that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, I'm re like right now, I'm in really excited about Snoop Doggy Dogg's new venture into selling marijuana, for example, right? So <clears throat> it's not that I want to sell pot, for example, but what he's kind of come up with, which, and he's right, is that marijuana in America is now essentially ending its prohibition, right? So they've legalized it in California and they've legalized it in Arizona or somewhere like, like two states is legal already. So he's brought in these investors to come up with a system, a bit like Uber Cab, where you can go on your iPhone and type in how much you want and click it, and then a map will come up and you hit that, and they'll deliver it to your door in 15 minutes. So they're using technology to sort of help kind of navigate the ending of prohibition in America. And of course, it's going to explode. You know, it's like Apple or one of those guys are going to get involved in it, basically. So I'm really thrilled by the sort of the process and the idea and everything else that he's going into. You know, I actually don't agree with people smoking pot. I find that it's a terrible thing that just kind of numbs your brain and stops you being creative. But it's the concept that I really like. But that's what I'm intrigued by, I think, because you say that you're driven by things you know, that you're passionate about or that have these intriguing concepts. But then from what you said, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, there does seem to be a lack of kind of passion for just shooting a girl in a dress. So what, what drives you to make fashion imagery then? No, the, the, it's there. I'm probably just not talking about it enough. I mean, if you shoot, you know, if you work for French Vogue or something like that, <coughs> and, <coughs> you know, you get to shoot the kind of, best pieces of the collections and stuff like that. I mean, I always go straight onto the internet after the shows and start trawling to see, you know, what we're going to be shooting that season and what's going to be interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm probably slightly downplaying it, to be honest. But I, I do get excited about it. I get excited when I can tell there's going to be something basically worth shooting. And I would say 80% of the time, there's not. Mm -hmm. So it's a small percentage at this point. Mm. But what drives you more, that interest in the clothes and working with the great collaborators or just that desire to prove that you can do it? No, it's not the desire to prove I can do it. It's kind of, at this point, it's sort of, um, <clears throat> it's like an auto response. It's what I do, you know what I'm saying? It's something I don't even think about. I just turn up and I go through the process. 
But it, it's so rare that you get something that really knocks your socks off. Like someone will put together an outfit and put it in front of you. I think the only thing that's really unforgivable in our industry is when people are boring. Because <clears throat> it's one of the few industries where you don't have to be. Like my hero in fashion is Peter Mourinho, the architect. You know, that guy that wears all leather. He wears the Robert Maplethorpe. You should of. have done that today. It would have been... No, but... I mean, sometimes I look at myself in the mirror and I'm just so disgusted by myself that I'm so banal that I have this opportunity where I could do whatever I want. But I'm like an accountant who doesn't want to take his calculator on holiday with him. You know what I mean? It's like, because I do fashion for a living, I don't do it at home. I just switch it off. But I could do anything. You know, the fashion industry is so incredibly tolerant of that you know what I'm saying so you look at someone like Peter Marino who's wearing this incredible out he's created this whole piece of theater about himself and I kind of admire it mm. you know and with there's not enough of that you mm. know I'm wearing sneakers and a bloody t-shirt you know what I mean it's pathetic really but I do kind of really miss that period where people spent a long time thinking about their outfit and dressing up and just putting in a lot of time for it so I guess if you come in today into the industry, you wouldn't know any different. So it would seem fine, but we came, we were so spoiled. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. But do you not think there is a nostalgia for that period, particularly amongst people coming into the industry now? There's a nostalgia for anything in the past, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I was saying to the editor that was complaining about today versus the 90s, I was like, I think in 20 years time, kids coming into the industry will look back and say, oh, you worked in 2015, that was the last great period of fashion photography because it was the last period of the printed magazine. So, you know what I'm saying? And then 20 years after that, they'll be like, oh, but you worked in 2045, that was amazing, whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? So do you think printed magazines are on their way out? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Netta Porter as a, as, an, as a concept is probably the future where you can just, you know, it's all about delivery and speed in everything. Mm. So that, that is a concept where you can not only look at your fashion magazine, but then buy that particular, of course, that you know, has to be the future. Mm. And you're not precious about that? You wouldn't mind seeing your imagery used in that context? No, as long as the images are okay. Why not? I'm interested in more of your views on, on the kind of this generation and on the passage of time. You speak quite interestingly about that because you've made, you made a really great comment in that Tyrone interview where you said that Paris Hilton is the sex pistols of her generation. And yeah, I truly believe that. Tell me more about that. He was that. horrified by that. He started going on about um, Dr. Dre and things. I was like, no, 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 you're missing the point. <laughs> you're completely <laughs> missing the point. Well, in the sense that each generation has a sort of... Uh, a sort of crossover, you know, there's like someone will do something that completely changes the way our culture thinks about something. So whatever your opinion of Paris Hilton, it's kind of irrelevant. The fact is she was a cultural landmark in the sense that she was the first person that really became globally famous for doing absolutely nothing, you know. So if you ask kids in the 1980s what they wanted to do for a living, they would generally answer, I want to be famous at, and then give you what they wanted to be famous at. I want to be a famous singer, a famous swimmer, I want to be a famous this or that, you know, make bows for a violin, whatever it was, they just wanted to be really famous at it, because all kids want that, almost. If you ask kids now, they just want to be famous, not at doing anything, they just want celebrity, right? So she was a very sort of, specific moment in our you know it was and I, I think what really caught me off guard is that she actually scared me in the same way I, I, I recognized a feeling within myself that I saw in my dad when he saw the sex pistols for the first time he was horrified you know he scared the shit out of him basically because he didn't understand it mm. and my sister's friends would come around with their green teeth and their spiky hair and he did just did not know how to process the information and I think he f came from a generation, you know, that, you know, they saw Elvis Presley and Marlon Brando, there were massive shifts, you know, significant shifts in their culture, but they could never imagine what it would look like 30 years later. And so when it came, it was just so like a, mm -hmm. so when I saw Paris Hill and I felt 
quite threatened by it and I was like what is it about this that makes me feel so uncomfortable and the point was that I just didn't understand it my mm -hmm. generation couldn't get their head around it does that that awareness of your generation is that a confusing moment because I imagine working in an industry and being you know as you said kind of that dictatorial side of being a fashion photographer where you can kind of you need to be able to create something that is kind of um new and unexpected and respond to things that are new and create that kind of new des that new desire if you feel like you can't understand kind of the the passions or the interests or the way of living of, of the newest generation is that a strange moment well whenever i see my friends kids the first line that ever comes out in my mouth is what do you know like what a, like show me something that you've because I always think they're going to show me something that I've never heard of. And once in a while they do, but most of the time they don't. They're kind of quite disappointing. And had my uncle come to me and said, show me something, I'd have showed him Joy Division, the sex, but I would have had so many things to slap down on the table. And whether he liked them or not, he'd have been, you know, he'd have had a sort of gamut of things to look at. But I never get showed anything by these kids. Like one of them said to me last week that he's really into Led Zeppelin. And I'm like, oh, it's like, you know, kind of, we're done. So... <laughs> And it's a little unfair to them because they have less stuff to, to work with, you know what I mean? Why do they have less stuff to work with? I just think there's less things going on, you know. So, I guess I'm sort of, I'm, I, I, rather than being scared of the future, I want to know what it is. I'm curious. I want to sort of be, a, I want to see it and I want to photograph it and I want to hear it, you know, anything that sort of present me with something I've never seen before. I think what was so startling about Paris Hilton was just so totally and utterly uninteresting it was and how famous she became you know what I mean it was really like it felt like our culture was sort of going like that but then I realized that's exactly what my dad would have said so out of Paris Hilton and all that will come something really interesting you know what I mean you just got to keep your eyes open to it so what's next for you then um I don't know, I might get into business with Snoop Dogg. I haven't decided yet. <laughs> do you think, do you still have that belief that you'll take your greatest picture that is still to come? No, not a chance. Why, why do you say that? Because the industry's moving in the wrong way. It doesn't lend itself to that. I'd like to think that. What was the last, the last good picture I took was I can't remember. I think the last time I got excited about taking pictures again was probably when I went back out onto the street and started filming people on the street again about five years ago, whatever. There was probably a few pictures in there where I was like, okay, this is good again. I'm You're sorry. going to have upset some of your commercial clients by saying you haven't taken a good picture for like five years. No, I mean, actually, interestingly enough, we are now heading into a really interesting period because um, I've just noticed in the last couple of seasons that the designers are coming with a completely different attitude. Like Gucci, for example, like Alessandro just took over. Yeah. And it was so exciting being on set with him because he's f completely free. You know what I mean? He's not thinking in a similar way to his predecessors and mm. what's coming next. So they sent me a couple of reference pictures and I thought, prior to the job, and I thought, oh, that's really great but I bet when we get to the set, we won't actually be allowed to do that. But then when we got to the set, we actually could do that. And he was really encouraging just to keep going and mm. keep going, which was so exciting, you know. So, um, and Rag and Bone was the same thing. Like I'm really, you're start, you are definitely feeling a shift back where people are like, okay, mm. enough with that. You know what I mean? Let's so move. So why do you say that the circumstances aren't right for you to take your best shot? Um, it's possible I'll look back in 30 years from now and find stuff in what I'm shooting today and think that it was really good. I can't see it though. I hope so. Why can't you see it? Is that you? I don't know. I mean, when I, I remember when Tyrone first started taking pictures, he sort of was like, well, there's nothing left for us because you lot did it all. You know what I mean? There's like, what, what new thing can you do or say in fashion now that hasn't been said already? which I thought, well, don't know if that's 100% true. There's always something, you know what I mean? But th he does kind of have a point, you know. Yeah, I think it's interesting. A lot of the young photographers that are doing very well at the moment does seem to be ones who um, 
emulate a past style, not ones that are kind of... Right, but then if you look at Jamie or someone like that, they're starting to bring their voice to the pictures and that's been lacking. You know, a lot of the... I think the fashion industry has put pressure on the younger generation to just give us what we want, give us what's already there. Like, don't push the boundaries. In fact, I was working on a job with an art director last week and he said that... He remembers working with a cosmetic company who'll stay anonymous and the photographer, also anonymous, did something that really pushed the boundary for them. You know, it was like yellow makeup or something that was so off the beaten track, you know, for this company. And the art director or the woman from the company literally had a heart attack on set. I mean, she was like nearly crying and I'm gonna get fired and da da da. Roll on 10 years, it's the only picture they keep showing people as like their sort of, you know, become their benchmark campaign, you know what I'm saying? So when you're able to do something that puts the fear of God in people because you're sort of shifting something or doing something new, that was always, you know, there was something so exciting about that when you felt like you were treading a little bit more new territory. And now that's so difficult and the demands of the magazines, they, I don't think the editors really wanted that. They encouraged the young photographers to give them a sort of quicker, cheaper version of what they were getting, you know. But it's, it, I can see in the, the sort of photographers that are starting to come through now, they are starting to find a voice for themselves and try some different things and push it a little bit, which if that encourages then another 20 photographers to do that and push that even further and then further, then you could end up with something really interesting again. But within a system that isn't gonna support it, that seems to be what you're saying. Yes, if the system's there to support it. And I do think, you know, there's always that cycle like everyone's bored right now, so everyone wants to try something new. You know, the editors are like, grab a kid, anyone new, like let's just do something, which is exactly what happened when I started. I suddenly noticed a lot of editors and design really just wanted to get you in there and sometimes made a mistake because your photography wasn't right for the magazine, you know what I mean? But they just heard that you were the hot thing to have and so they just wanted it. You know, it's the emperor's new clothes, basically. Was that a strange moment for you, though, crossing over from being the kind of odd new thing to being part of the establishment? Yeah, I liked more being the odd new thing than being part of the establishment. Is that maybe what's keeping you going, trying to still be the odd new thing? Well, it's funny you say that, because I don't think of myself like that. I think of myself as like one of the granddads of fashion at this point, kind of pretty much geriatric but <laughs> this this editor had me on the floor laughing about a week ago because she's obviously new and young and doesn't understand anything and she called me up and they're like yeah we're doing this piece we're doing three different covers and it's all about the new style of photography and I want Jamie Hawksworth and Tyrone and you to do it and I nearly fell off my chair I was like <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny so in you know, it was a lack of education on her behalf that she would say something like that, but it does display within the fashion industry that sort of blindness, you know what I'm saying? But that's kind of what I was saying, it's like whoever <clears throat> did it most recently did it first. Yeah, that definitely exists, there's just no doubt about that. <clears throat> but that's just a lack of education. <clears throat> but how do you... Uh, what are you trying to say? Does it not annoy you that people will do imagery that like isn't <coughs> new and then be lauded for it being innovative? Um, <coughs> okay. No, not really. Do you think it's just because, it, does it go back to that thing of not being competitive? No, well the nature of the beast is that. So if you don't accept it then leave. It's what it is, that's the industry. So you either participate in it or you walk away. The, the mistake is to not feel comfortable about it and stay in, you know what I'm saying? Because then you're just angry all the time. You know, our industry right now is that, and so you're like, okay, well fine, let's just jump on the bandwagon and do it too, you know what I'm saying? Mm. You intrigue me because a lot of the photographers or designers who I interview here, they talk a lot about the themes that you're talking about, the pace of the industry or the difficulties of creating new work and they are angry and they seem frustrated but you don't seem angry or you don't seem frustrated no i like it. i think the change is good i mean it's it's not you can be cynical about it and say that it's progressively getting worse there's no doubt about it that it is from a creative point of view <clears throat> you're selling 
you know, my, the first advertising job I did was for a client who probably made, who probably pocketed a hundred grand a year, if that, right? And now working for companies that make three billion dollars a year, right? So, you, if you look at the curve of that, so of course, with that extraordinary change in finance, there has to be more and more and more parameters. You know, it's global branding. So. Um, I, yeah, I don't really believe in just sort of moaning all the time and just, you may as well just get on with it. It just seems like a waste of energy to me. So, you know, all other industries are changing and moving and shifting and, you know, they're all unrecognizable too. You know, if you came into Apple, for example, in the 1980s, you wouldn't recognize what exists today in 2015. So why would the fashion industry? It doesn't make sense. So you're still excited for the future? Yeah, I mean, I'm still excited for the future unless, let's say Netta Porter, for example, does become the system in which we all work in. If Netta Porter finds out that they could sell more magazines by us doing more and more and more uninteresting commercial pictures, and that's what we're forced to do, at that point I'll leave. But, but right now that's not the case. So, What would you go do if you left? I would do a hotel with Snoop Doggy Dog probably. <laughs> Glenn, thank you very much. Okay. Welcome.